So good to see Fred here. You know, I'll just miss that. Uh, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm sure you're happy as well to get out of the hospital. I know you hate that. But, so. I know there's still a journey to keep praying, but it's so good to see you. Um, when I was in high school, I went to I went to a pretty rich high school. It was a public school. Um, but, you know, it was a rich public school. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't come from a rich family. I don't come from a poor family. But at my high school, I was, you know, bottom level at my high school. And, and in high school, I saved up my own money, and I, I was able to buy my own car. I bought a 15-year-old BMW. It was scratched, dented, and leaked oil, and coolant, and it smoked and sputtered. It was an environmentalist's worst nightmare. Um, <laughs> but I, I loved that car. Um, and I worked, I worked so hard to keep that car running, and I replaced almost everything in that engine. And I learned so much from working on that car in high school, trying to keep it running. Um, and I, I loved that car. It was a stick shift. That's how I learned how to drive stick shift. And it was just so much fun to drive. But every morning, when I would drive to school, I would pull into my student parking lot, and I would drive by new car after new car after new car, and not just new cars that are like. Kia's or Toyota's, not that there's anything wrong with that, but new cars like BMW, a new Mercedes, a new Audi, like $80,000 cars, $100,000 cars, and I see 16-year-old girls driving up in these cars, and I'm driving past them, and I'm thinking, man, if, as I'm parking, if I were to scratch one of their doors, it would cost more to fix that scratch than it did for me to pay for my entire car. <laughs> And so, so as I drove into my student parking lot every morning, I loved my car. But every morning, pulling in, it looks, I got those, those moments, I was, I was embarrassed of my car. Yeah, I was embarrassed of, of not having enough money to have a new car. Or, or to, to fit in with the crowd. I got looks like you are in the wrong place. You are lost. You're at the wrong school. And they judged me. They would never say this to my face, but they judged the value of me being a person based on the car I was driving to school. Right? And we all kind of have been in that moment to some degree or another. Right? Maybe it wasn't in high school. It starts in elementary school, really hits its peak in middle school and high school, where we are judged based on the shoes we have, the clothes we wear, the phone we carry around, the house we live in, whether we have the newest video game or even a game system at all, right? And it doesn't stop in school, okay? We, we get out, and even as parents, we feel this pressure in culture, right? This culture puts pressure for you to strive for that job promotion. Get that better job, that bigger paycheck, so you can have the bigger house, the fancier car, the nicer vacation, provide everything your kids would ever possibly want. And they judge you, they judge your parenting skills based on how well you provide on the tariff, right? And that has nothing to do with your relationship with your kids or with your spouse. And that we feel this pressure in society that all we do, and we are judged based on how much money we have, right? And it doesn't even stop there. It goes into retirement, right? Even into towards the last years of our life where the whole purpose is to make that 401k as big as we can get it, right? So when you retire, you can sit on a fat lump of cash <laughs> and, and enjoy the rest of your years, right? And if you can't afford to put away and if you can't afford to save for retirement, then somehow your life wasn't as successful as some other people, right? We are viewed by culture that if, if we retire without having, you can't rely on the government, they can't pay for you. They're going to be bankrupt. All of a sudden, we are judged on the success that we have based simply on how big our bank accounts are, right? And we've all been there. This is the society we live in. And it... It causes problems, right? We see it when the economy tanks. A few years ago when it was really bad, we hear stories about people who, who are even committing suicide because 
of the economic situation. It's because they have so much stock of their own identity wrapped up in the stock market that when the stock market crashes, their identity crashes, right? Their identity, their heart is wrapped up in the stuff they have and how people see them based on the stuff you own. That all of a sudden, when our bank account drops, man, we drop, right? And we see divorce rates skyrocket. And the number one cause of divorce, you probably know, is money issues. Issues related to money. Trouble in the home, providing, paying the bills, making ends meet, making ends meet. And, and that is a real stress. I don't want to. I don't want to hear you. I don't want you to hear me making light of that. But, but our culture puts so much emphasis on money and on how that is tied to our identity of who we are. We are judged based on how big our bank accounts are, or what phone we have in our pocket. Right. Open up to Matthew six. Matthew chapter six. Um, I think we have a scripture on this. Verse 19 is perfect. Because Jesus looks at this and he goes, what is going on? Okay, this isn't a new problem. Right? He talks about it back in his day. It was an issue. And he says, who told you that this is the way life should be? Who told you that you are only as good as the money you have in your pocket? Who told you that it's okay to judge your identity based on, on the stuff you own, right? Okay, verse 19. <coughs> Jesus speaks to this. Do not store for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Skip down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and is tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. See, our culture looks at that scripture, looks at those words, and they say, that is stupidity. That is foolishness. Okay, if you don't worry about your financial future, if you don't worry about having the latest stuff, then no one's going to give it to you. you got to go out there, you've got to get it for yourself. And if you can't get it for yourself, then maybe you're not as good of a human being as the rest of us. That's a ridiculous statement, but that's the underlying tone in our culture, isn't it? And... And Jesus looks at this and he says, no, who told you that that's the good life? That that's how life's supposed to be? And we sit here and we worry and worry and spend hours and hours stressing over how to pay our student loans off, over how to make, pay the mortgage, over how to make ends meet, over how to plan financially for our college, for our kids, and, and our future. And Jesus is sitting here going, who told you that life is supposed to be that way? One of my favorite movies is Fight Club. Okay, and Fight Club, I know it's it's filled with violence and language, and there's some sex in it, and so it's not a good movie for that. And that's not why I like Fight Club. 
So don't go out and watch Fight Club just because I mentioned it. Because I don't, I'm going to tell you all the good parts about Fight Club here without all the crud in it. So this is good. But I love Fight Club because at the heart of that movie is this text. And I swear the guys that wrote that script sat down and read Matthew 6, verse 19 through the end of the chapter. And they're like, you know what? Those are some pretty good quotes in there. I think we're going to pull those out. Maybe change the language for modern day and just drop them straight into the middle of this movie. Okay, if you haven't seen this movie, the two main actors, Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, these two actors that, that play the two main characters in Fight Club. And Brad Pitt plays this kind of fanatical, radical guy who, who is trying to get people to realize that, that the stuff they have doesn't matter. Okay, he, he's, he's trying to get this philosophy through people's heads. Okay, and Edward Norton plays his counterpart, his partner, who just doesn't quite get it through the whole movie. He's trying to understand, trying to grasp his philosophy, but he doesn't quite get it, okay? And, and Brad Pitt has all these amazing quotes that come straight out of Jesus' mouth. And I love that. Because it's like God is dropping his truth right into the middle of the cruddiest movie Hollywood's produced. <laughs> okay? Because, because Brad Pitt says stuff like, he repeats it. He goes, you're not the contents of your wallet. You are not the job you work. You are not the car you drive. That is Jesus. And he says, look, the stuff you own ends up owning you. Man, that's a great interpretation of, of what Jesus is trying to say here, right? The stuff we own ends up owning us. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Your identity gets so wrapped up into the stuff you have that all of a sudden, if you don't have that stuff, you all of a sudden don't have yourself. You lose your heart. And that's what this movie is all about. And he goes in and he says, we need to develop the ability to let that which does not matter truly slide. To realize that the stuff that we have, the jobs we work, doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. So let it slide. Okay, one of, the, one of the best scenes in that movie, and the reason why I bring this movie up is for this scene. Brad Pitt and Edward Norton are driving down the road. Okay, they're driving on a freeway, and it's pouring rain. Okay, and Brad Pitt is in the driver's seat, Edward Norton's in the passenger seat, and they're having an argument. Okay, because Edward Norton doesn't quite get it. And so Brad Pitt is getting frustrated with Edward. Okay, so he's just like, okay, fine. And so he lets go of the steering wheel. And they're barreling down the freeway, he just lets go of the wheel. Edward Norton grabs his wheel, and he's like, what, what are you doing? And Brad Pitt's like, look at you. You're, you're pathetic. And Edward's like, what, what are you talking about? Come on. And he's trying to steer from the passenger seat, right? And Brad Pitt's going, look at you. Let go. You've got to learn to let go. And Edward's like, what? He's like, look, you can't let go. And that's what we do with Jesus, isn't it? We were sitting in the car barreling down the road of our life, and Jesus is in the driver's seat, and we're in the passenger seat, and we're sitting here like this, in the passenger seat. And Jesus is sitting there going, look at you, you're pathetic. <laughs> okay, look, look at the birds in the air, okay? Here in El Segundo, we have hundreds of crows. I know, because they, they like to fly outside my apartment at 6.30 in the morning and you know? And they wake me up every single morning, and I pray, like, Stop fighting for so many birds. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, look, look, I, you see all these crows flying around town? You think they worry about what they're going to eat tomorrow? No. And yet, I provide food for every single one of those birds. You see the weeds on the side of the road? Man, when they bloom, they look better than you on your best day. Okay? <laughs> you think you matter to me a little more than some birds and some weeds? And yet, look, you can't trust me enough to let go. I'm the God of the universe that holds this world together. And you think you can run your life better than I can. You think you have a better plan. You think you can provide for yourself better than I can. You think you know best. And we're sitting here going, I can't let go. And Jesus is saying, let go. Because until you let go, I can't truly steer your life in the direction I want it to go. Right. And, and, and the culture looks at that and says, that is foolishness. Okay, and for, I want to stop here for a second. 
And I want, I want you to hear what Jesus is not saying here. Okay? Because Jesus is not saying that having stuff is bad. Okay? He's not saying that money is bad. The problem comes when we let our hearts get taken away with our money. Okay? And we, we've heard about financial peace earlier this morning. And I've been through that. That is great. It's been helping me a lot. Yes, you know me all the time. I see the modes and all that. And this text is not about, oh, don't worry about anything, you know, just, God's not short on cash, so he'll take care of me, I just feel a little, you know, they, <laughs> this text, this text is about, where is your heart? Right? Where is your heart? Because the heart of this text, what God wants us to get out of this is, look, you can trust me. The birds trust me. The weeds trust me. Why can't you? You can trust me with this. I've got this. All you got to focus on is being a part of my kingdom. That's what he wants us to get out of this. We can trust God. That's the whole purpose of this text. So what, what does that look like? Well, as students, as parents, as retired people, empty nesters, in our culture, maybe instead of spending all our time worrying and planning and stressing over having the latest phone, having the newest car, having the biggest house, having the fancy vacation, having the job promotion, having the biggest 401k, instead of worrying and focusing our lives in that direction, what if instead you focus simply on, have I spent time with God today? Have I heard God today? Am I being who God called me to be? Am I loving the people that God is putting in my life? Am I doing what God is calling me to do? That's the shift that Jesus is calling us to. It's not saying be stupid with your money and throw it away because you'll get more. God will provide for you. He's saying you've got to focus on the things that you should be focusing on. You should not be focusing on providing for yourself because I am doing that for you. You need to be focusing on how you are spreading my kingdom and how I'm calling you to spread my kingdom. Okay, so, so what does that look like? Well, maybe it starts simply this week by waking up and just saying to God every morning, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to try and let go. God, I'm going to try and focus on my relationship with you above my finances, above my bank account, above my job. Because what happens is we start striving after all this stuff, and, and as parents, we start working at jobs and putting in all the overtime hours to provide, and we all of a sudden, we're, we're left with no relationship with our kids. We're left with a marriage that's failing. We're left with a relationship with God that is strenuous at best. And we get to a point where it's like, what have I been working for? What have I been striving towards? In the grand scheme, it's nothing. Because when we pass on from this life, your heart has been wrapped up in the things of this world that will eventually turn to dirt. And you're going to get to stand before God heartless. And you're like, I don't know what happened. I lost, I lost myself back there somewhere. Jesus is saying, look, you've got to focus first and foremost on your relationship with me. Because that's the only thing that matters. And when you become so sucked up and, and integral and a part of my kingdom, then all of a sudden you're not going to have time to worry and stress about all that other stuff because I'm just going to be taking care of it for you. Yeah, you may not be the richest kid on the block. You may not have the fanciest things. But guess what? You're going to be the richest person in this world. And what, what if you took all the hours that you spent stressing and worrying over making ends meet and paying the bills and getting the mortgage done? And you shifted that to worrying and stressing over, what am I doing for God's kingdom? How am I spreading God's kingdom? How am I being a part of God's kingdom today, this week, this month? How am I making my life shine in the darkness and be a salt in this world? Okay, so that's, that's what this text is all about. That's what it looks like. This week, simply, every morning, for the rest of your life, getting up and saying, God, I'm putting my relationship with you First, above my job, above my retirement plan, above my kids, above my spouse, 
above everything else because without my relationship with you, it's all a waste anyways. Right? That's what Jesus is getting at here. So as, as we look at this text, that's the message that Jesus is saying. He's sitting here going, you're pathetic. Let go. Let go. And let me see, let, let me take your life where I want it to be. Because until you truly let go, then Jesus can't really have control of the steering. And we can't really be free to truly start living the abundant life that we were created to live. Okay. Let's see. <coughs>